Good day, dear viewers, and a very warm welcome to our format visit. At this point, thank you again for all your entries at VisiT at QS24.tv. Of course, this gives me a collection of topics and I am always happy to prepare a program and devote myself even more intensively to this topic, including today's topic. A dental topic is certainly not always in the focus of general medicine, and yet, of course, areas of expertise overlap. I believe that everyone has an incredible justification in their place, but only together can you really solve and clarify problems. That is why today's program is dedicated to a patient who visited us due to her increasing parodontitis. Parodontitis is the decline of tooth decay. The teeth are already quite free, and in the past there have been various treatments. The patient is overweight at the end of her 50s and asked, what advice do you have from a holistic point of view? I would like to go back to the fact that, of course, parodontitis, which used to be called parodontosis, is always the same when it comes to a substance, a tissue, that is receding or degenerated. In medicine, we speak of osis in Latin. But ultimately, an inflammation always precedes the whole thing. And that is why the expression of stomatitis or gingivitis, better said, for tooth inflammation and parodontitis, can also be attributed to exposed teeth due to the decline of the tooth retaining apparatus. I might have to go back a bit to the so-called Koch postulates. Robert Koch laid the foundation for them as a scientific foundation. He observed that whenever microorganisms, bacteria or parasites lead to an infection and with the help of an antibacterial therapy, this disease and thus also the burden with the bacteria is receding. It is an infectious disease. In 1882, an American dentist, Miller, discovered a so-called chemoparasitic therapy. And thus, through such a chemomechanical therapy, for the first time, he also brought toothpaste to life where we could actually keep our teeth healthy against these bacteria in the context of our oral environment. So, again and again, we could keep our teeth healthy very intensively. Of course, this led to the fact that we were all challenged. To brush our teeth regularly every day as children, to take mouthwash, disinfecting mouth spray, to take antiseptic mouth solutions, also colloidal silver or antibiotic-enriched toothpaste. Parodontitis is one thing. The other is, of course, caries. And it is incredible that it is hardly possible today to look a child in the mouth with healthy teeth. And I remember, I was a young doctor and treated a baby who had a neurodermatitis. That means, this baby only felt uncomfortable in his own body due to the strong itching. And I always asked the mother, but also the grandmother, to come to the consultation. Because as long as the little boy grows up and is cared for by his mother and grandmother, they both have to follow a nutrition plan. And when the boy was about nine or ten years old, 
His teeth were like snow. Because he didn't get one thing in those years, and that was sugar. And today we say that up to 60% of children already suffer from tooth decay. And the caries itself is an expression of too much sugar. And it is not crucial that the microenvironment in the sense of bacteria, but what is created in our mouth by our malnutrition. And the saliva has a very high and basic pH value. You all know what a pH value is. That is the concentration of hydrogen ions, and it shows me the environment of this organ, or this part of my organism. That is, when the oral mucosa, and it is naturally formed by the parotid glands, by the tongue gland, by the gum gland. This mucosa is incredibly viscous, but consists of 99% water, but also has lysozymes in it that act antibacterial, and also enzymes that make the mucosa more viscous. And this mucosa has to be in an incredibly good constellation. Constellation means that it must not fall under a pH value of 6, and it must not be regulated above 7. This is important because this mucosa is also responsible by releasing calcium and phosphate from the teeth when this pH value drops. And this drop in this pH value is not directly due to microorganisms, but to the environment. That means, whenever the environment, also the microorganisms living in the mucosa, there are lactobacillus in it, there are also staphylococcus in it to a small extent. But if this oral environment shifts, and that's the case, for example, if we take a lot of lemon with us, then the pH value of the lemon is only 2 to 3, that is highly acidic, but beer has 4, coffee 4 to 5, milk 5 to 6, sodium, of course, 13 to 14, highly acidic. But the most important thing is that whenever we take sugar with us, it is of course wonderful for the microorganisms that live in our oral cavity, and these are millions. And these microorganisms, they first convert the sugar to, for example, acetic acid, to formic acid, to lactic acid, and that dissolves, and that has an aggressive effect on our teeth. And that's how these brown spots are created, and that's how this enamel, of course, that changes, and we call it caries. It can also attack the mucous membrane of the mouth. That's why the biggest appeal to all parents, to all mothers, and above all, to all grandmothers and grandfathers, is to reduce the sugar for the children. They say, what you don't know, you don't miss. That means, if children don't even learn it in this abundance, then they can lay significant, great foundations for optimal and good teeth health even tomorrow. That means, these biscuits and everything sweet, whether it's Nutella or jam, or even carbohydrates, sweet drinks. That's all, what the teeth, of course, with just brushing, not at all, are able to cope with. That's why it's not the bacteria that's the problem, but it's the mouth environment that's the problem, because these bacteria form these aggressive acids, which then attack the tooth melt of the children.
just as, of course, the inflammation of the mucous membranes. And the dentist can actually do a test when he palpates the gum very lightly and sees some blood on his fingers, then the mucous membrane is swollen. That means, the mucous membrane is inflamed. I think you can also notice that sometimes when you brush your teeth and then spit out the mucous membrane, and the mucous membrane still contains some blood fibers. These things are really very, very important and I don't know, if you look at it, Ludwig XIV never saw a picture where the man was painted with an open mouth. The man was toothless because he only ate sweets from morning to evening. These people were, of course, privileged at the time. But I think that our huge repair society today, that we need a completely different view, and this high proportion is, of course, in no way somehow through a cleaning technique able to make up for it again. Especially the people who didn't have that for many years, thousands of years. But of course they didn't have this high proportion of daily nutrition. With periodontitis, that is, when the gum recession occurs and thus, of course, a deep gap between the tooth and the bone is created, this is, of course, a problem that is related to a changed microenvironment and thus also a changed environment as a result of too big of a protein load. The microenvironment can change incredibly if the pH value in the mouth rises above 7. That means, if now this bone bag between the tooth and the bone, which is not at all relevant for both the dentist and all other imaging measures, contains a so-called sulcus fluid, which forms strongly when the pH value goes up in the mouth. That means, now this sulcus fluid secretes a liquid that allows the normal germ in the mouth flora, that is, Porini Romanus gingivalis, to have a drastic increase, it switches off the healthy immune defense. That means, as a result of this bacterial inflammation, the tooth substance now becomes more and more a tooth decay. And of course, due to the inflammation, every chronic inflammation creates a cell scar and in this regard the tooth becomes increasingly free. The temperature is increased locally. That means, whenever local inflammation occurs, the temperature rises. And with the increase in temperature, the environment and the heat and anaerobia, like this germ, which can only develop under airlock, is essentially acquired by this. That's why it's important to erode how and which measures or risk factors to switch off in order not to bring such a change in the oral environment to bear. Smokers are already quite privileged in terms of development of periodontitis, because the smoker, due to his high degree of toxicity, but also due to his change in microcirculation, and that means that it leads to an increasing circulatory disorder, also in this area, to an infestation of these bacteria, which are ultimately responsible for periodontitis. So, 
smoking basically doesn't make a lot of sense. The other thing is that periodontitis can be a disease that develops in the context of a known diabetes, also type 2 diabetes. The so-called insulin diabetes is predestined to develop an increasing environmental shift in the mouth. And thus, of course, the nutrient base for such a disease. Any diabetes takes 10 to 15 years. Any diabetes is always an adaptation of the organism to its changed metabolism situation. Any diabetes is also nourished, bred by daily life, and I think we could very well face this disease, which affects every third person over 60. By simply walking it off, by increasing the proportion of movement for people. But everyone has their own diabetes, and everyone has their own insulin resistance, and of course, the excess weight it's the chronically inflammatory processes that simply result from an increased belly fat. We have already made a visit episode about these things, and these are things that are at great risk of leading to periodontitis a person who is overweight. naturally has many changed metabolism situations, whether on a hormonal level or due to his metabolism adaptation in the context of malnutrition over many, many years and lack of movement. Sometimes different things come along. It is called here to turn over at the beginning of periodontitis, to rethink, and to take your body along on this path. And the fourth risk factor is of course stress. Please do not underestimate what stress does to us. Stress is always the adaptation to a very active phase in my life on different levels. It can be mental, it can be physical, it can be physical, it can be psychological, and the possibility of encountering such a process in the short term. In the short term, all of this is not a problem, but if this stress lasts longer, then of course there is a clear change also in microcirculation. And microcirculation tension always means hypoxia at the end, oxygen loss for the cells, and the system forms 24-hour acetic acid, gastric acid, carbonic acid, uric acid, and must always provide such a great load of counterbalance that the body with all these things can also be pretty medium term, maybe I'd rather say medium term, overwhelmed. And that's why it's important that you have both periodontitis, which you just noticed, as well as bleeding gum, whatever. As soon as you become aware of it, do I actually have it on the plate that strengthens my health, or are these things lost? Of course, we live in a time where we no longer eat whole grain cereals, but we have made extract flour. That means, back to Dr. Brugger, of course, whole grain cereals already contains the power of nature. You can't say otherwise. And by making wheat flour, we only use the extract that, of course, as a high-carbohydrate diet, naturally provides people with less on various levels, as well as, of course, as a necessary B vitamin substance, which is no longer nearly as relevant as daily bread. We no longer eat oranges. Oranges contain fiber. In the past, people thought it was ballast. It is ballast. It's fiber that you don't need at all, and it's simply excreted. It's not that simple. 
So these ballast substances have a very, very high and natural and useful value. But we squeeze the oranges and make orange juice out of them. That's just as little good as, for example, the sugar beet. And of course, we only take the refined sugar from the sugar beet. These are all things that within our mouth, teeth, and chewing device significantly. Damage Wheat Flaxseed, everything that we also in the context of a high ballast content, the daily apple, but with skin and hair, also the core. These are almonds, these are nuts, what we crack, this is the cabbage, this is the vegetable that we eat raw as carrots, these are the fibers. I am incredibly excited about my two kids at home, three and five years old. They jump on the ceiling when the carrot is ready and they want to have peeled the apple and they still want a piece of fennel. And when you teach the children from an early age, How important and how wonderful these things taste and you don't steer your palate and your taste buds in the wrong direction, because sugar is also an addiction, please don't underestimate that. When you eat sugar, the fast carbohydrates, that brings a massive rise in insulin, but in a short time the sugar is on the floor and you have to take sugar to yourself again because you feel it, because you develop a certain addiction. All of this is not necessary in any way. And at this point I would like to recommend a very nice book by Wolb and Tennant. It is called The Nutritional Toothbrush. As dentists, you have solved the whole problem of this disease and explained it in a very simple and practical way that you can prevent such a disease. A lot of things are done out of the blue, but we humans don't look at it anymore and we have in our consciousness to take things more seriously. Sometimes driving the child against the wall is more important than waking up. That's why it is so important not only to take macronutrients like protein, fat and carbohydrates, but also to think about the micronutrients. And I don't mean from the pharmacy or from the health food store. I simply mean what comes on the plate. The valuable blueberries, the nuts, the more colorful you make a vegetable plate, raw, the richer it is in plant secondary colors, the polyphenols, the vitamin E, anti-inflammatory through almonds and nuts or vitamin A, also through the really good butter. Sometimes a piece of liver or lamb's lettuce or carrots. These are things that are incredibly valuable. The other thing is a healthy mouth flora also needs a healthy mouth hygiene. You can do that by oil pulling every morning for 10 minutes. Use sesame oil or sunflower oil. It is taste neutral. You can also use coconut oil or coconut fat. Not more than 10 minutes. Strongly through the teeth and then clean the teeth well. You can also put a little bit of alkaline powder into the water. You don't always have to use toothpaste. And above all, not daily with so much fluoride, because the fluoride has a long-lasting effect on the enamel substance or in the long term also on our epiphysis that is the vertebral gland, which calcifies and thus the melatonin in its great task for the body to act antioxidant, to detoxify the brain, also becomes insufficient. For 300,000 years there have been humans, but for 3 billion years there have been microorganisms. The bacteria and the justification came not from us, but from all these good, many 100,000 million helpers. And if we use mouth flora in this regard well with probiotics and please read up on effective microorganisms, 
then I have to tell you that everything that is increasingly poorly metabolized or a healthy microflora watches over too much acid, watches over too much sugar and only ensures that a pH value can again and again adjust to this equilibrium. These many good also. Substrates that are produced via the gut flora, such as bitterate and acetate, all these are things that are produced by microorganisms and thus reduce the inflammation in our body. Certainly, we have not yet done justice to this topic, but I just wanted to make it clear to you that a lot is really homemade. And in the first instance please do not think that you can get even better toothpaste or even better tooth cream to solve a problem here, but you need to decide what to buy. You decide, do I chew my healthy foods in my mouth until they are really liquid? Do I take the chewing power in my hands or do I just swallow because it just drips down? Recently I read that Coca-Cola is not a food, but a lethal agent. A big bottle of Coca-Cola has 70 pieces of sugar. Be aware of this in silence. What can it simply change? And what happens all of a sudden all by itself again and what happens? Maybe you should just get in touch with people who go through this problem and look at their plates and learn these things in a great seriousness. Step by step. And as I said, The Nutritional Toothbrush is a very successful book. And on this exciting path back to a stable and great tooth health it can never be early enough. I wish you a lot of joy and look forward to the next visit and thank you for your letters. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.